With nephrolithiasis, nephro refers to the kidneys, and lithiasis means stone. So nephrolithiasis means kidney stones, sometimes also referred to as renal calculi, or urolithiasis. Kidney stones form when solutes in the urine precipitate out and crystallize. And although these most commonly form in the kidneys themselves, they can also form in the ureters, the bladder, or the urethra. Now, urine's a combination of water, which acts as a solvent, and all sorts of particles, or solutes. In general, when certain solutes become too concentrated in the solvent, they become supersaturated. Urinary supersaturation of certain solutes results in precipitation out of the solution and the formation of crystals. Those crystals then act as a nidus, or a place where more solutes can deposit, and over time it builds up a crystalline structure. This can happen if there's an increase in the solute or a decrease in the solvent, as would be the case with dehydration. In addition, there are substances like magnesium and citrate that inhibit crystal growth and aggregation, preventing kidney stones from forming in the first place. In the majority of cases, the inorganic precipitate is calcium oxalate, formed by a positively charged calcium ion binding to a negatively charged oxalate ion which results in a black or dark brown colored stone that's radio-opaque on an x-ray, meaning that it shows up as a white spot. Sometimes, instead of oxalate, the calcium binds a negatively charged phosphate group to form calcium phosphate stones, which are dirty white in color and also radio-opaque on an x-ray. Calcium oxalate crystals are more likely to form in acidic urine, whereas calcium phosphate crystals are more likely to form in alkaline urine. The exact reason why these stones form is usually unknown, but there are some known risk factors like hypercalcemia and hypercalciuria, having too much calcium in the blood and urine, respectively. Hypercalcemia can result from increased calcium absorption in the gastrointestinal tract, as well as hormonal causes like primary hyperparathyroidism. Hypercalciuria can result from impaired renal tubular reabsorption of calcium, which leaves a lot of calcium behind in the tubule. For the calcium oxalate stones, hyperoxaluria is a risk factor as well, and it can be due to a genetic defect that increases oxalate excretion, a defect in liver metabolism, or a diet heavy in oxalate-rich foods like rhubarb, spinach, chocolate, nuts, and beer. There are also uric acid stones, which are red-brown in color and radiolucent under an x-ray meaning that they're transparent to x-rays and don't usually show up very well. At a physiologic pH, uric acid loses a proton and becomes a urate ion, which then binds sodium, forming monosodium urate, which crystallizes and ultimately forms uric acid stones. Since uric acid is a breakdown product of purines, a very common reason for high levels of uric acid is consuming lots of purines. Purine-rich food includes shellfish, anchovies, red meat, or organ meat. High levels of uric acid can also cause gouty arthritis, most commonly in the first metatarsal joint, which is the base of the big toe. A fourth type are struvite stones, sometimes called infection stones, which are a composite mix of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. These form when bacteria like Proteus mirabilis Proteus vulgaris, or Morganella morgenii, use the enzyme urease to split urea into carbon dioxide and ammonia. The ammonia makes the urine more alkaline and favors precipitation of magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate into jagged crystals called staghorns because they often branch into several of the renal calyces and look like the horns of a staghorn deer. Like the calcium phosphate stones, Struvite stones are dirty white and radio-opaque under an x-ray. Risk factors include urinary tract infections, as well as vesicoureteral reflux and obstructive uropathies, both of which are also risk factors for urinary tract infections. A tiny minority of stones are cysteine stones, composed of the amino acid cysteine, which sometimes leaks into the urine to crystallize and form a yellow or light pink colored stone that's also radio-opaque under x-ray. Finally, there are some rare stones made of xanthine, which, just like uric acid, is a byproduct of purine breakdown. 
These stones, also like uric acid stones, are red-brown in color and radiolucent under an x-ray. Kidney stones can cause dull or localized flank pain in the mid to lower back on both sides, as well as renal colic, which is a sharp pain and is a bit of a misnomer because the pain is usually constant rather than intermittent. The pain is caused by the dilation, stretching, and spasm caused by obstruction of the ureter, and is typically worse at the ureto-pelvic junction and down the ureter, and subsides when the stone gets to the bladder. Stones that are less than 5 millimeters across are usually passed within hours. Diagnosis involves a history and physical exam, as well as imaging studies like x-ray, CT scans, or ultrasound. And finally, a urinalysis, because it might show microscopic or gross hematuria, which means blood in the urine. Treatment or management includes hydrating an individual to reverse the process of precipitation. Also, medications might be given to help reduce pain, reduce stone formation, like potassium citrate, and to help stones pass through, like alpha-adrenergic blockers and calcium channel blockers. Also, shockwave lithotripsy might be used, which is a non-invasive treatment that uses high-intensity acoustic pulses that travel through the body to break up the kidney stones. Finally, surgery and stent placement might be needed for larger stones. Alright, as a quick recap, nephrolithiasis is the formation of kidney stones, which form when solutes precipitate out into crystals in the urine. The most common type of stones are calcium oxalate stones, though other types include uric acid stones and struvite stones. Thanks for watching.